controversial in that my, my views very often don't accord with the established view as relate to us by the BBC and other august uh, organs of, um, of propaganda. Um, but I don't, um, I don't anticipate everybody agreeing with everything I say. And I don't even want everybody to agree with everything I say. You know, my, my aim is uh, always when I give a talk and, and when I, I write on my blog and elsewhere, my aim is to try to provoke thought and trying to provoke people to consider what their own opinions are, maybe sometimes to challenge received opinion, to, and you know, if I can make people even just wonder about whether they're right about something, uh, then that's what I'm out to achieve. And I'm, I'm certainly not someone um, who gets annoyed or upset with people for having a different opinion, ever, at all. Uh, I, I once said that if I only had friends who agreed with me, I, I wouldn't have any friends at all, though. It would, uh, would, would be very difficult. But, um, that's very much the... Um, uh, that's very much the atmosphere that I like to have at, at, at meetings. I, I, I want people to feel free to express their own opinion, even if it's radically different um, uh, to mine. Um, and I would add uh, that obviously going along with that attitude is a consciousness that I'm not myself right all the time. And my own opinions change uh, from time to time. Um, and one example I might give is actually the European Union. I, I, I was a very strong advocate of the European Union. I, I'm not, I, I rather believed in um, Euro-federalism uh, as, as a goal. I, I was up at the kind of extreme of the pro-EU spectrum, really, for most of my adult life. Um, and then I was absolutely shocked by what happened in Catalonia, where during the Catalan referendum, you had paramilitary forces literally battening old ladies and um, I, I was expecting some strong reaction from the EU. And the next day we had Juncker saying that it was necessary for the maintenance of law and order. And then I thought, well, at least the, you know, the European Parliament will be better. Uh, and we had virtually every single group leader in the European Parliament standing up one after the other um, uh, to condemn not the paramilitaries, but to condemn the Catalan government and, and to back the vanquished violence. Like I call it vanquished because Rajoy's political party was founded by seven of Franco's ministers, specifically in order to carry on the Francoist tradition. Um, uh, and the, uh, it, not even in the EU Parliament was there a strong reaction against uh, what had happened. So, um, yes, my opinion on the EU changed, um, and now I find myself in the middle of the Brexit debate, actually not having that strong an opinion either way. Peculiarly, I, I, I've become almost agnostic on the issue. Um, I, I think freedom of movement within the European Union is one of the greatest social developments of my lifetime. I think the worst social development of my lifetime is the ending of the university education. I can't believe uh, that I'm part of a generation where, <laughs> down in England, um, and for English students coming to Scotland, the chance of a free university education has been, has been lost. That's one thing that's gone horribly wrong with the UK. But I think the freedom of people to move freely around the European Union has been absolutely wonderful. Um, so that I, I'm very keen to maintain. And I've ended up in a position where a kind of Norway deal, where you're essentially in but not part of a political cooperation, is something I could live with. But my, I just give that as an example of an area where my opinions change. Uh, and I think it's wrong uh, to be dogmatic. And one reason why I don't get people upset when people disagree with me is that I may change my mind and find myself agreeing with them two weeks later. And I think uh, anyone whose mind isn't open to change uh, you know, <laughs> is not in an intellectually healthy position. Um, ha having said that, all was a sort of introduction about 
the way I think and the way I like to, to talk at meetings, I, I, I'd say that it follows from that that um, it shouldn't be entirely a one-way process. So I'll finish in plenty of time to have discussion, I hope. But if at some stage I say something so outrageous uh, that you feel the need to leap to your feet uh, and object, um, feel free. Uh, you don't, don't feel you have to wait till I've, I've finished. If, if you want to um, interject, um, I, I don't mind that at all. The word, the word heckling, incidentally, comes from uh, a process in the Dundee jute mm -hmm. industry, where, where heckling uh, was uh, a process of combing the jute, which was done by female employees in Dundee, and they were famously political active, politically active and radical, and used to go to political gatherings and yell and scream at the politician, uh, and, and they were the hecklers. Uh, and that's where the, where, where the word comes from. Just a, as this is a historical society, yeah, an, interesting, <laughs> uh, an interesting historical thing to, to throw in. It wasn't my intention to, to come here today, and I should say, quite genuinely, I, I never use notes, and I, I never ever know what I'm going to talk about at the time I stand up. It was, tends to be rather stream consciousness, as you've probably already worked out. Um, but it wasn't my intention coming here today to talk to Julian Assange but, about Julian Assange. But I think I think I should perhaps start with that, given that I've just been right at the centre of uh, the biggest news story in the world today. Uh, so maybe I'll tell you um, a little bit uh, about what the thinking is from the WikiLeaks team and, and Julian's legal team, and where we're going forward on on that. Um, Today, the BBC uh, news I, I noticed on, on the radio coming here um, has tried to shift the agenda, as we knew they would, back to Sweden and back to the sexual allegations, because that's much more comfortable ground than the establishment and attack on freedom of speech. And um, a group of 70 people, mostly Labour, MPs, group of 70 parliamentarians, has written to the Home Secretary asking him to extradite Julian Assange to Sweden. Um, uh, and that was the lead item on, on the BBC news bulletins I heard this morning. Um, and, and this is, you know, we've heard a lot about unicorns in the Brexit debate. Well, this is, this is a unicorn in the Assange case in that there currently is no extradition warrant from Sweden, um, and there's no sign that there's going to be an extradition warrant from Sweden. Um, and I don't believe there will be an extradition warrant from Sweden. The, um, the allegations in, in, in Sweden, we always believed, um, I've been saying for the last um, seven, eight years, um, were not genuine and was simply a ruse in order to get hold of Julian for extradition to the United States. We, we always thought that was simply a step in the process of getting him caught up in the legal system uh, while they formulated uh, an extradition, uh, a reason to extradite him uh, to the US over the uh, WikiLeaks revelations about the war in Iran and Iraq. And I think the fact that, a meet, that he was removed from the embassy and immediately charged with a US extradition warrant for the Chelsea Manning revelations, um, that's fairly strong evidence that we were right. Mm -hmm. And that is what it was about all along. Where does that leave the, the Swedish allegations? Well, the um, uh, the Swedish police and prosecutors interviewed um, Julian in the embassy two years ago. Now, there, there's, there's an important part in this process, which is very important people understand and which is not generally understood. Um, there have never been charges in Sweden. Julian was never charged with any offence in Sweden. Their system is not the same as the Scottish system or the English system. Um, 
they have investigative prosecutors uh, who work with the police, and the investigative prosecutor uh, it was. But when these allegations first surfaced, Julian was questioned by a prosecutor in Sweden um, and actually asked permission to leave Sweden from that prosecutor and was given permission and, and left. That prosecutor, who was the general prosecutor of Sweden, who was the chief prosecutor in the country, um, having reviewed the evidence, decided that there was no case to be. But under the Swedish legal system, uh, prosecutors are independent. And if one prosecutor won't bring a case, you can go to another prosecutor and ask them to bring the case. Um, now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, is open to discussion. I can see pluses and, and minuses to it. <coughs> On balance, it doesn't sound a bad system to me, but it's not, it is different, it's our system. And what happened is the solicitor for one of the complainants went to another prosecutor, a lady called Marion, and uh, has a surname spelled N-Y, which I think is pronounced new, but my, my Swedish isn't, I think isn't good. Uh, a prosecutor who was known for having um, you know, a strong feminist agenda, which again is, I, I'm, I say purely as a neutral fact, I'm, I'm not giving that good or bad associations, uh, but who specializes in this kind of case. So that prosecutor decided to reactivate the case um, and to issue a warrant requesting that Julian return for um, uh, for questioning about the allegations. But that is not a charge from the court. And what, um, and no court has assessed the evidence or anything. What the long extradition battle in Julian's case was about was a question of whether or not a warrant from a prosecutor for questioning, as opposed to a charge from a court with a warrant, could activate the European arrest warrant, because that hadn't happened before in the UK. And it was not the intention of Parliament when they passed the European arrest warrant that a prosecutor, as opposed to a judge, should be able to issue such warrants. Anyway, um, what happened was uh, the extradition uh, request was lost on the grounds that um, uh, the law, but that there genuinely was, it, uh, in the Supreme Court, expressed agreement with the fact that that wasn't the intention of the law, that prosecutors, as opposed to judges, would be able to issue such ones, that the law was drafted in such a way at Westminster uh, that the warrant was viewed as valid. But what happened is, um, immediately after Julian lost his case at the Supreme Court, an audit and council was placed amending the law so that in future it could not be done to anybody else. And now only judges and courts can issue requests for European arrest warrants which are considered valid in the UK. Um, sorry, that was all very technical and dull, but what it, what it does mean is that now if Sweden wants to issue a new warrant, it can't be from the prosecutor, it can't be from that particularly motivated prosecutor. That particularly motivated prosecutor now has to go to a judge and a court and say, this is the evidence, will you issue a warrant? Um, and our assessment, and the legal team's assessment, is that the balance of the and I don't want to get into the detail of the, uh, the evidence, I, I will have but I, I prefer to leave it for now, um, that the balance of the evidence is such that a court is very unlikely to say, yes, that's strong enough for a charge, uh, and we will reissue a new European arrest warrant. Um, Greg, where does that stack up with the American legal system? Well, I'll, Are you going to get dinged on that? I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that. Yeah. I'll come on to that. The, um, so, our, our opinion is that the, the Swedish thing is dead, it's gone, and it, it appears to be gone. 
and that these 70 MPs saying they want Julian to be extradited to Sweden is you know, it's completely pointless because there is no charge against them in Sweden and there is no warrant for him in Sweden. And that a new warrant would have to come from a Swedish court and a Swedish court is most unlikely to grant it because when the um, prosecutors and police interviewed Julian finally two years ago over two days in the embassy, it was fairly plain from their demeanour and from what they said that the case just didn't stack up. It wasn't a prosecutable case. Um, but we will see. We're, we will see what comes. We don't rule out some trickery whereby the Home Secretary tries to claim that it's not a new warrant issued by a court, but actually the old warrant is reactivated in some way. Um, we don't quite see how he can do that, but that's one possibility of what he might do. But the, uh, the thing is being used by a distraction. If you look at the people who have signed today's uh, petition saying that he should be extradited to Sweden, even though Sweden's not asked for him, um, it's signed almost exclusively by uh, Labour Party people who supported the Iraq War. Um, <laughs> And in, in my view, but the whole Swedish thing still remains a distraction which people are desperate to grab at because people in what I would call the political centre, which is well to the right, the political centre in the UK is not where the political centre was when I was a young man. And I should say, my, my political views are, are saying that on the EU I will change my mind, but my, my basic political views haven't changed a lot since I was a student. Uh, when I was a student, um, I thought that, which was at the time of Thatcher, when privatisation was just starting, it was my belief that utilities and natural monopolies should be in public ownership. So water, electricity, gas, those things should be publicly owned, railways. Um, uh, and, and I was in a political centre somewhere. I was a member of the Liberal Party. Uh, people probably viewed me as centre-right. Nowadays, for thinking that the utility should be publicly owned, you are on the hard left. I, 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 now, I actually haven't changed my economic opinions at all. I'm now a communist, having been on the centre-right when I was 19 with exactly the same views. And, uh, and you know, when we use the term of political centre for people like the Blairites and the Labour Party, they are pretty right-wing. Uh, in any healthy country, they would be viewed as the right-wing. But here, we have mad racist nutters as our, uh, as our right wing in Parliament. Um, and, the, and, and somehow you have all these people in the Labour Party whose views are to the right of where Thatcher was in 1980. And I, I find that absolutely astonishing. But those people are desperate that the conversation about Julian should not be about the fact that the United States wants to extradite him and to try him for the publication of Chelsea Manning's revelations about the Iraq and, and Afghan wars. And we should remember what was in those revelations, you know, that there was material um, showing the deliberate killing of journalists in Iraq. There was material showing the shooting of children in the head by US forces. All, uh, no one's ever been to jail for any of those war crimes. No one. And yet Chelsea Manning uh, spent, spent seven years in jail for having revealed them. And now they want to put Julian Assange in jail for having um, revealed them. The American, uh, fighting the American extradition request is, is going to be difficult because um, uh, the UK, again, under the Blair government, the UK signed an extremely one-sided extradition treaty with the United States which doesn't actually allow the courts to properly test the validity um, of a case um, against somebody. Uh, but it's been, and it's very unusual for the, for, for the um, UK's legal system, um, there's been a fair amount of judicial activism and pushback. And you may recall that over the last decade there have been quite a number of quite high profile US extradition cases where the courts have found a way uh, not to extradite people. And in cases like another friend of mine, Lolly Love, uh, and Lolly is a hacker, um, Lolly um, uh, eventually got off because, or well, didn't get extradited, 
because um, of his uh, Asperger's syndrome and the effect of prison conditions in the United States on his Asperger's syndrome. So it wasn't just on the grounds of prison, the appalling prison conditions in the US. It was, a, it was a mixture of that in his medical condition that enabled him to evade extradition. And other people found other creative ways of evading extradition. And Julian's legal team are going in the first instance to argue um, that he shouldn't be extradited because it's a massive attack on freedom of the media. Uh, because if, you know, if we reach a stage <coughs> where journalists cannot publish leaked material, uh, that closes down uh, huge uh, areas of, of journalistic investigation and, and would have cut off some of the great stories of, of, of the last century. Uh, speaking back to, to other people, like Dan Ellsberg's material on the Vietnam War that was leaked, for, for example. That if you start to criminalize journalists for publishing information given them by whistleblowers, you're going back down a very, very dark path indeed. Um, uh, and that's where I fear we may be heading. Uh, but the extradition treaty with the US is worded in such a way it's very difficult to make that into a defense. Uh, against the treaty which basically says as long as the request is received in good order from the US, you have to stick them uh, on the plane and send them over. So, um, precisely what the, and I should say, I was saying that I was, I, I was stuck with Julian's legal team and, and others for the last week um, discussing this. I would be wrong, I, I'd be lying if I pretended that I understood every case and everything that the lawyers were uh, 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 we're coming up with and, and, and working on. But we'll see, we'll see that unfold um, in the time to come. But I am, I'm, I'm personally pleased. I, I should say, on a, purely on a personal level, um, I, I, I never thought it was a very sensible idea to go to the Ecuadorian embassy in the first place. It's not how I would have handled it. But it's um, Julian's life, and he was under enormous pressure, and that's how he decided to, uh, to do it. So I've always respected that, that decision. But I'm actually quite pleased he's now, he's now out, because for the last year, conditions for him in the embassy were absolutely terrible. I haven't been able to see him for a year, because the Ecuadorian embassy, I was one of quite a number of people who the Ecuadorian embassy would not allow in to see him at all. They allowed in uh, his legal team occasionally, and they allowed in people they viewed as absolutely politically neutral or inactive, um, uh, who were purely, uh, if you like, social guests. So, um, uh, so that's one of many ways in which I'm not in the same category as Pamela Anderson. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, but I, I've, not, I've not been able to see Julian for years, but at least I'll be able to see him in Belmarsh Prison, which will be, which will be good. And also be able to get the medical attention mm -hmm. He, needs, he hasn't seen a dentist for seven mm -hmm. years, for example, uh, and he has a number of dental abscesses. So um, uh, that's good. And I'm very happy that we can now concentrate on the question of, of media freedom, mm -hmm. which is what the extradition to the United States is about. And it's also worth saying that, that um, the, uh, the, the extradition to the United States is not about uh, the Clinton emails and the DNC in 2016. It, it is specifically about Chelsea Manning and the Iraq and the Afghan war logs. That, that's what it relates to. Um, and I should say, I, I keep saying this to people everywhere. I, I absolutely assure you that A, WikiLeaks have never received anything from the Russian government in order to publish it. And B, there was no cooperation between WikiLeaks and no contact between WikiLeaks and the Trump campaign. What The Guardian published about Paul Manafort visiting Julian in the embassy, absolute lies, just completely and utterly untrue. The two have never met, and Paul Manafort never went to the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, Julian has also <coughs> never met or spoken with Roger Stone. Um, and uh, this may be getting into, into more detail than interest to you, but the other person who was considered as a possible intermediary with the Trump campaign, a chap called Randy Credico, mm -hmm. who's another friend of mine, did visit Julian, but has no contact whatsoever with the Trump campaign. He did once, years ago, work with Roger, Roger Stone on a cannabis legalization campaign, and they had that 
contact, but that was not related uh, to WikiLeaks. Um, and uh, 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 what happened was, when WikiLeaks started releasing uh, the uh, Clinton emails, Roger Stone contacted Randy Pedico, saying, Randy, you know Craig Murray. Craig Murray knows Julian Assange. Can you hook me up? Because Roger Stone wanted to get in on the loop because he wanted to find a way to make money out of it. And he, uh, and he sent emails to Trump's campaign uh, claiming to have links to, to WikiLeaks because he wanted to get to boost his own importance and capacity for making money. And I should say, on, on the US side, especially my, my friend Randy, who's called a, the church mouse, all these people, Manafort, Trump, Stone, they're little crooks. So there's no, no doubt about that. But they're not crooks with a, a, a contact with WikiLeaks. And I, so this whole diversion was taking much longer than I expected when I started. But uh, I'd like to say, finally, as well, that people um, have often asked me whether, through my association with WikiLeaks, I have any regrets about Donald Trump being elected. Um, and uh, the answer to which is no, not at all. I, I have no end of regrets about Donald Trump being elected, um, but I don't feel in any way responsible for that. I don't think WikiLeaks was responsible for that. I don't actually think if the DNC emails hadn't been released, it's, it would probably have changed the election results. I think people massively overestimate the influence of that on, on, on what happened. And you're talking about you know, multi, multi-billion dollars political uh, campaigns, uh, and whether the release of a little bit of information swayed that. I doubt it. If it did sway it, it's nobody's fault but Hillary Clinton. Yes. Because what those emails showed was Hillary Clinton and the DNC committee deliberately conspiring to steal the primaries from Bernie Sanders. Yes. And they showed, just to give a couple of examples of what was in those emails, they showed that the scheduling of primaries by state was discussed with Clinton, who's a candidate, between the committee in order to benefit Clinton because she wanted to get momentum by having her best states first. And they scheduled them that way in order to help her politically. And they also showed, for example, that in doing a live debate with Bernie Sanders on telly, moderated by CNN, uh, Hillary Clinton was handed the question secretly in advance. And that was shown. And Donna Brazil, who was one of the highest paid employees of CNN, had to resign over that. Now, whose fault is that? Is that WikiLeaks' fault? Having been, WikiLeaks got the material given to them, and they published it. Is it WikiLeaks' fault for publishing it, or is it Hillary Clinton's fault for cheating? It's Hillary Clinton's fault for cheating. And this, this blaming the messenger business is completely uh, ridiculous. And had um, WikiLeaks has been handed stuff from the Republicans or from Trump, they would have published that too. And the fact is, they weren't. Uh, and WikiLeaks is a body which doesn't go out and get its material, it publishes what it is given by whistleblowers. And that's ma material which was given to WikiLeaks by a whistleblower. Uh, that whistleblower had legal access to the material. Whether they could legally give it is a different question, but um, that you know, journalism often consists of publishing stuff you weren't given legally. Anything given you by a government employee, they shouldn't, is illegal in that sense. Um, uh, and the motivation of the person who gave it to them was that they were sickened by the corruption and cheating of, of Hillary Clinton in the crime. It, it's as simple as that. Um, uh, <laughs> but I'd also None of that's probably enormously controversial, um, but let, let me leave you with one thought, which is when considering Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump has not has, has done several things which I, I disagree, particularly um, on immigration, what he's doing, I think it's horrible. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of his domestic reforms on health care, for example, you know, are unpleasantly motivated and, and not nice. Um, I think his recognition of Jerusalem as a capital, and especially his recognition of the annexed Golan Heights, is dreadful. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he hasn't started a war. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but he hasn't. If you look at all the wars Obama started, 
and all the wars Tony Blair started. Uh, Donald Trump has not started a war, and he has de-escalated Syria, and he has de-escalated North Korea, and he hasn't gone in further than <coughs> Libya. Um, would he, I think there'd be a lot more dead people in Syria now if Hillary Clinton had got in. I do believe that. Uh, she had a long history as a warmonger. Most of the wars Obama started were due to Hillary Clinton. Uh, the invasion of Libya, where, where NATO bombed and killed 15,000 people in Sirte alone, which is something you'll never hear from either <coughs> the BBC or the Dublin Guardian. Uh, that was down uh, to Hillary Clinton. And based on um, a totally false story that the inhabitants of Benghazi were all about to be massacred by an army of Gaddafi, which never existed. Uh, and that was just as true as the stamp saying, can kill us all in 45 minutes claim. These um, moral crises are, are invented by politicians and dammed up by the media uh, to persuade, uh, to justify uh, military action, which is essentially almost always about Western control of natural resources, as it was in Libya and as it, as it was in Iraq. But Trump hasn't done that. I mean, to be fair to Trump, why I should be fair to Trump, I have no idea. But to be fair to Trump, he is less of a war hawk than Hillary Clinton. So from the point of view of domestic US policy, um, I think he's far, far worse. From the point of view of the, far, of the rest of the world, I actually think he's, he's rather better. The only qualification of that is being better than Hillary Clinton for the rest of the world is an extremely, <laughs> extremely low bar. Yeah. Um,